There we go. We're back to the beginning. Welcome class to Classics 160D2 Classical Mythology. In today's lecture 11.3 on Homer's Odyssey, uh, if you're out there watching uh, a recording of this, I've already done this once, forgot to record it, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about today, an announcement and recap by me. Uh, Darcy will talk about the final draft of the proposal. Katie is going to talk about Atalanta and female heroes and heroines. Uh, Julianne is going to talk about the interrelated cinematic Greek universe. And then Matt and Colin are going to talk about our, um, our text for today, The Odyssey, with Matt giving an overview and then Colin talking about how it's been received over time. So announcements, you guys know the deal by now. Go ahead and put this thing into speaker view. You can see me, you can see the words, you can see everything you need to see if you have a message. Uh, message somebody who's not talking because I'm the world's worst multitasker, so apologies for that. Um, but yeah, send a message to somebody else. Uh, and then what you really should have on your calendar right now is um, the research proposal is going to be due a week from today. All right, so make sure that thing is is getting underway. When it comes to the research proposal, this is an expansion of your first draft. Feel free to use parts that you've already written if they're good. You're going to have to massage it a little bit and make sure that it flows smoothly, uh, but you can absolutely use the work that you've already done. On the other hand, if you've written something and you're like, this is total crap and I hate my topic, get rid of it. This happens all the time in research, right? Uh, I know all the grad students know like they've had this great idea, they've embarked upon it, only to realize that literally like 120 other people have already done that idea. Or they've had another great idea, embarked upon it, realized there is no information at all on it. Um, so again, seriously, this happens all the time in research. If you need to change your topic, you don't need approval. It might be useful to run it, the new one by your TA, um, but, uh, but that is certainly totally fine to do. Um, in terms of extra credit, if you go to the Think Tank Writing Center or the Writing Skills Improvement Program, or both of them, I will give you uh, a little bit of extra credit. Go ahead and download the sheet, Fill out your name and your TA's email and stuff like that, and then the person you work with will just forward that to them. And TA's go ahead and just keep an Excel spreadsheet or something. Um, and, uh, oh, somebody asked, can the SALT uh, Center Writing Lab count as well? Absolutely. Any, any of like the, the university kind of writing labs in the different corners of campus, uh, that's all good. Um, okay, yeah, and if you do multiple of, them, multiple of them, all the better. What we've talked about so far this week, right, are quest heroes with the idea that rather than somebody like Achilles, who's more, who's known more for his like strength and speed and ability in warfare, these quest heroes are, um, they're associated with very particular stories, a, a quest to achieve, or not just achieve, but obtain something, right, a person or an object. Um, they are frequently in motion pursuing that object, and then they're helped by their, their kind of helpers along the way, they're hindered by their enemies, that sort of thing. And in particular, we have talked about Perseus and Medusa, uh, exemplified in this awesome statue from the mid 16th century in Florence here. Uh, we have talked about Bellerophon and the Chimera, right? And remember, Bellerophon's the one uh, who's able to mount the, uh, the winged horse Pegasus uh, in his defeat of the Chimera. And then on Wednesday, we talked about Jason and the Golden Fleece uh, with his accompanying Argonauts. What you're looking at here, are, these are all scenes from the, uh, the 1963 film, which you guys are actually gonna be watching over, uh, over the Thanksgiving week. So rather than kind of a, an official live class during Thanksgiving week, I'm gonna put this, uh, the, the film up and just watch the film over the course of the week. Um, it is interesting in the sense that it tells us, you know, it gives you a sense for how people from the 20th century received um, kind of the, the classical myths associated with Jason. It's also just awesome uh, to see them try to make an epic movie in the 1960s with like <laughs> Poseidon or something coming out of a bathtub here and then Jason fighting like claymation dudes over here and then another claymation Talos over here. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's kind of hilarious and terrible. I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Darcy. Darcy, the stage is yours. Tell us about the final draft of the research proposal. Sounds good. Um, so I'm going to be brief about this. Um, we've got some really good material about the Odyssey and about uh, different heroes to cover. So let me just briefly say, um, so we, we've talked about this. It's due next Friday, right? So just make sure... Um, you're going through it this week and you've got everything polished and 
and ready to go out. So um, sources, talked a lot about this too. Make sure you've got at least two primary, at least two secondary. Um, so the primary are gonna be ancient sources. It's kind of, you know, showing you where all this information originated from. Um, whatever your whatever your particular project is, the, the primary sources are gonna be the origination for that. And then the secondary sources are kind of what came later, right? So what have people thought about it since um, this material originally came out? So just try and have a conversation with those um, and really flesh out how those sources are gonna help you produce this final project. Um, for the final project itself, make sure in your, in your final draft, you're just getting more specific about how you're gonna accomplish this. Um, you know, be clear about why you're choosing that specific format, um, you know, how, how that best suits your project. Um, and then read over the, the assignment sheet. Make sure you're really clear on exactly what you need to do for this. Um, if you go to content and then go to all materials and then go to the assignment sheets and syllabus, you'll find it in there. So uh, just a few things to touch on. Make sure it's between 750 and 1500 words. Um, also add a section discussing why you've changed, what you've changed and why from the uh, first draft to this final draft. Um, and then just make sure you're talking about significance. Why does this really matter? Why do people, why should people care about this project in general. Um, and then finally, just uh, so the other TIAs and I, for the rough draft, um, tried to provide you with a lot of very specific feedback. So just make sure you're, you're checking that feedback and you're incorporating those things into this, this final draft. We would be so sad if we um, read your final drafts and saw some of the same mistakes and then looked and saw that you hadn't checked your feedback. So please make sure you're checking that feedback in incorporating those changes. Um, and that's that's really all I've got for today. So I'll go ahead and hand it over, I think, to Julianne. Yes, hello. I think that I am next. And then Katie will talk about Atlanta afterwards, which will be awesome. Um, so like Dr. Rob said, we're talking about uh, all of the myths and how they kind of interact. And we, we titled the slide the Greek cinematic universe, kind of like the Marvel cinematic universe. Although, of course, ancient Greek, they didn't have movies and cinema. So maybe it should be the Greek mythic universe. Maybe that would be a more appropriate title for the slide. But we just wanted to show, show the parallels between the Marvel universe and what's going on over here with the Greek myths. So um, obviously we've kind of seen with uh, Jason and the Argonauts is really kind of like the Avengers story where they all come all together and they go on this quest and it's wonderful. And you have Jason and you have Medea. And I mean, you all read Medea for last week. So you've seen how um, they have their own stuff, their own story. Medea has her own story outside of um, her relationship with Jason or tied into her relationship with Jason. Um, we also know that Heracles is a part of Jason and the Argonauts. At one point, Orpheus joins. So it's really all the big names and myth kind of come together for this. But we have talked a fair amount about them individually and kind of the stuff that they've done. Um, and they have their own stories. So... Like we saw with Jason and Medea, obviously there's Medea and there's the other myths about Medea that kind of ties into that. Heracles has so many different versions of stories about him, so many different iterations. He's in so many things, interacting with various different people. Um, but something that I kind of wanted to draw our attention to that uh, is interesting is that it's not just these heroes and these heroines that have their own myths and their own stories across the um, well, across the Greek mythic universe, I guess. And Katie will talk here a little bit more about Atalanta, who is another heroine that joined the joined the Argonauts. And so again, you have all of this fun, cool crossover stuff. But there are other characters too that um, the Greek audiences would be familiar with from other stories and other myths, not just the heroes and the heroines. So you have Circe, who is off in the corner here, <laughs> the painting of her. Um, and she was in the excerpts that you had to read for your, or you got to read for your reading response from the Odyssey this week. Um, and so she exists in other sources outside of the Odyssey. Um, so there's actually, I mean, you see her in the Odyssey, we encounter her, she has kind of her own little mythic, 
stuff going on. Um, she interacts with some of the others. There's also um, a source that is reported to have existed, but uh, as far as I know, it's no longer extant. Uh, the Telegonia, which is like a about um, Telegonus and Telemachus, Odysseus's two sons. And so uh, Telegonus is the son that Circe bears from Odysseus and um, Telemachus is the son that he has from Penelope. And so there's basically this whole other source that is accounted, like recounted and other ancient sources, but um, uh, we don't read, we don't discuss. I just learned about it recently. But, um, and so like Odysseus's sons do stuff and Circe ends up in this account, marrying Telemachus, and there's there's a bunch of crazy stuff going on, but they have their own stories again outside of uh, the Odyssey. You also have the Sirens; they appear in other myths. Um, in Jason and the Argonauts, they have the Sirens, and um, actually Orpheus it saves the Argonauts by playing his lyre to drown out the Sirens. Um, and overpowers them. You also have the Scylla, who is again another monster from the Odyssey that is encountered in other sources. Um, and actually in some later sources, she's conflated with um, Scylla, the daughter of Nissus, a river god. And um, so then you have the story that she was turned into a monster by Circe. Um, so basically just kind of showing that there are uh, these characters and the heroes and the heroines all exist within the larger universe, but also some of the smaller side characters do as well. And these characters would have um, been familiar. They would have been known to the audiences and they would have these uh, background stories, kind of like you get um, with the Avengers when you watch their solo movies and then you watch them all together. And so even though you're seeing them all together, you know about them from these other stories, which does kind of add more uh, characterization and make the story a bit more um, I feel like it makes it a little bit more interesting. But yeah. So now I think we're going to have Katie's going to talk a little bit more about Atlanta. So another one of uh, these heroes, these heroines, sorry, my bad, who um, crosses across multiple sources. So let's talk a little about Atlanta. She's one of my favorite characters in this sort of mythic, uh, mythic tradition. She has, she has a lot going on. Uh, so she is born to this guy, Yasis, who is pretty salty that he didn't have a son. So he's like, well, I don't want this. So he basically just drops her off into the woods. And, and uh, well, a lot of things happen, and we'll get to that in a minute. But she, uh, she's not a demigod like a lot of the great heroes. She, uh, she doesn't have a godly parent. However, if you go a little bit back in her bloodline, and you'll you will find on her father's side um, Zeus, on her mother's side we have Poseidon, and depending on which mythological tradition you're looking at, you can find a lot of other a lot of other gods floating around. Ares is in there. Um, so, so we already have the sort of precedent that she's going to have some pretty cool abilities from that. Uh, interestingly, her uh, Zeus is her great, 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 great grandfather on her father's side. Uh, and her great, 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 great grandmother was Callisto, who, if you remember when we talked about that myth, uh, ended up getting turned into a bear. Um, Atalanta, when she was abandoned in the woods by her father, ended up being suckled by a bear. Uh, and that's how she didn't die. And then eventually she was found by some hunters and raised by them. And she became extremely proficient with a bow. And that sort of leads her to be renowned as this, as this great huntress. Uh, and that brings us to the story of Meliager and the Caledonian boar. Uh, a little bit of background on Meliager because this he's kind of a tragic figure and this story is just very unfortunate for him. Uh, Meliager is a hero who, when he was born, the fates came to his mother and they said, uh, if the, the log that is currently in the fire ever is like burned up by the fire, then Meliager will die. And so she immediately takes the log out of the fire and basically just like unlocks a cheat code for her kid to be functionally immortal because whatever the fates say is what's going to happen. So as long as the log is intact, then nothing's going to happen to Meliager. So he like becomes this great hero and he's just, he's unkillable because of this prophecy. Uh, so the Caledonia Boar story starts as many stories do with a king uh, screwing up and not doing anything to fix it and instead having other people come in and solve this problem for him. 
Uh, so annually, King Oeneus had to give annual sacrifices to all of the gods. And one year he forgot to give that sacrifice to Artemis. Uh, so Artemis was mad and she sent this just huge boar. It's described as being like larger than the largest bull. Other sources have it being like twice as wide as it is long. It, I don't know. It's just, it's just a big pig. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's extremely deadly. It's terrorizing the countryside. It's killing people. It's destroying the crops. So King Oinius is like, okay, this is a problem. I need to have somebody deal, deal with this. And he calls in a bunch of heroes, um, including Atalanta and Meliager and other big names. Like we have Theseus and Jason and Dryas, who's a son of Ares. And we have Castor and Pollux, who are sons of Zeus. And Lita, if you uh, if you remember her, she was the swan story. <laughs> uh, so they all come in, and they're all they're mad because Atalanta's here. We don't want to go on this hunt with a woman. Like that's not that's not okay. But Meliager is in love with Atalanta, and is like, no, this is great. She's going to come with us. It's going to be fantastic. You all need to be on board with this. So they they sort of give in, and they all set out on this hunt, and they. Uh, they find they find the boar and they're going to attack it and Atalanta shoots the first shot and it hits the boar and Meliager is like Atalanta has drawn first blood and he's very excited about this and uh, everyone else is like no I must be the one the boar so they all run in somebody somebody gets Atalanta's like uncle three times removed who is gored by wild boar deals the killing blow with a spear and he he technically wins this because he's he's struck the final blow but he's like Atalanta drew first blood so she should get the prize and he gives her the pelt of the boar but his uncles are super mad about this they're like no this is it really hurts their pride that a woman has been given the prize the prize in this hunt so they come to try to take it from her and Meliager kills them and then his mom, who apparently just didn't wait to get any sort of explanation for this, just heard that her brothers had died. Uh, she just throws the log into the fire and Meliager is killed. So that's that's all very unfortunate for him. <laughs> but Atalanta, Atalanta won. So, yay. OK, let's uh, let's move on to the next slide. All right. So. Uh, Atalanta was also involved with the Argonautica, as I'm sure you are tired of hearing us saying. We've said it a lot in the last couple of days, but she was there. Um, this chronologically, the timeline is a little unclear as it is with a lot of myths, but this probably happened before the Caledonian boar hunt, uh, mainly because Meliager is also part of the Argonauts and obviously is alive uh, to, to do that. <laughs> so um, Atalanta is the only woman who joins this quest for the Golden Fleece. And again, there's a little bit of conflict about this, but everyone ends up agreeing that like, this is fine. She, she invokes um, Artemis and everyone's like, okay, well, you've invoked a God. So, <laughs> so we're just going to play along with that because we all know that we don't mess around with the gods. Uh, she joins in some of the battles there. She, she gets wounded at one point and Medea ends up healing her. And also pretty notably, she, at, uh, the funeral games that they have, def ends up defeating Peleus, who you might remember as the father of Achilles in a wrestling match. Her name, uh, Atalanta actually translates as, I believe, something along the lines of equal in weight, which a lot of people have taken to mean that she, like, was she could best any man also maybe a wrestling reference <laughs> uh so a story that you may or may not be familiar with this is probably the, the story that Atalanta is most well associated with is the story of the foot race and this happens after Atalanta's father finally like discovers that she's alive and he's like, wow, you've done a lot of things. So I've decided that I'm going to accept you as my child now. So come on back and we're going to get you married. Uh, Atalanta is not super into this. She received a prophecy when she was pretty young that if she ever married, it would be ruinous for her. So she say, I'll get married, but 
I will only marry someone who can beat me in a foot race. And this is like, this is key because Atalanta is like the fastest mortal that is around. Like she's faster than literally anyone on earth. Like it's just, it's just what she does. She runs very fast. Uh, it's, so she sets up this sort of race track and she has all of her suitors come. And if they want to have the chance to marry her, they have to beat her in this foot race. And if they lose, they are executed. So the stakes are very high here. Uh, a lot of people get executed. Like it's, it is a bloodbath on that end. Uh, she, it's even said in some stories that to sort of even the playing field, she would let them run halfway before she started running or she would wear and she still ended up beating everybody uh, until this guy Hippomenes comes along and he's like, okay, well, I would like to run this race, but I would also not like to die. Uh, so he prays to Aphrodite and he's like, please help me, help me do this and give me something that's go going to allow me to win this race. And Aphrodite is like, yeah, I got you. Here are some apples, some three, there are three golden apples. It's always a golden apple, as we know from uh, the Trojan War. She gives him three golden apples and he's like, and she's like, okay, uh, throw these while you're running and you'll win the race. And so they're, they're sprinting down this foot race path and he throws the, he throws the first apple and these apples are like enchanted so that when, when they're thrown, Atalanta has to chase after them and pick them up. So she goes and she gets the first apple and then she starts running again and she's catching up to him. So he throws the second apple and she runs after that. And this, and this continues with the third apple and he manages to win. Um, but critically he, uh, he forgets to thank Aphrodite for helping him win this. And he ends up, he ends up marrying Atalanta because he technically won the race, but because he didn't thank Aphrodite, she's like, okay, well, vengeance is now mine. And she, uh, she like causes them to decide that a good place to consummate their marriage would be in a temple of Sibylle. And we know that uh, doing things in temples is not good. Uh, so Sibylle gets very upset about this and she turns them both into lions. And you can see that in this statue over on the right, that's Sibylle with her lion chariot that she likes to uh, use to ride around. Um, yeah, so that's kind of an unfortunate end <laughs> in for the Atalanta plot line. But I don't know where I was going with that sentence. <laughs> that's, that's how Atalanta's story ends. Uh, the Greeks thought this was sort of a fit, fitting punishment because apparently they didn't think that lions could mate together. They thought that lions mated with leopards, which is not correct, but that's, you know, that's what they believed. So um, let's, let's push it on to the Odyssey now. All right, so it's time for a little crash course in the Odyssey. So, um, the Odyssey is kind of like the sequel to the Iliad, um, supposedly written by Homer. We already discussed why that may be supposedly. But it starts out, um, funnily enough, not with Odysseus, but with his son and his wife. So, uh, Odysseus has been gone for essentially 20 years at this point, after the Trojan War. Um, everybody came back, and then Odysseus wasn't there. So uh, they're trying to figure out, is Odysseus dead? Is he alive? Is he just not coming home? And um, meanwhile, Penelope, Odysseus' wife, has a lot of suitors, all vying for her hand, all want to be her husband and the new king of Ithaca. So um, Odysseus' son, though, who was pretty much just born, when he left is now 20 and he is trying to fight off these suitors. And so he is like, he can't really get a hold of them. And so he's like, I'm going to go find dad. So he, at the same time, you have the gods and goddesses and they're kind of thinking, all right, what's happening. And Athena's like, Hey Zeus, Odysseus, he's been being pushed around a lot. Let him come home. So, Athena goes down to help Telemachus, says, hey, go to see, go see Nestor, go look for help. And he does. Nestor sends him to Menelaus. And Menelaus goes on a long tirade about how he got shipwrecked off the coast of Egypt. and He had to wrestle a guy to find out how to get home. 
And he ended up finding also about what happened to the different heroes. Um, so uh, actually, the, what happens to the different heroes, Agamemnon, as we know, or I think we know, uh, gets stabbed. Ajax the Greater kills himself. Diomedes goes home, gets kicked out by his wife. And Ajax the Unders, younger, pissed off Poseidon and died. So big story here in the Odyssey, big theme. Don't piss off the gods. Um, that'll usually save your hide if you just honor the gods. All right. But Menelaus does know where Odysseus is. He's captured on the island of Calypso. See now? Calypso. So, story shifts. Odysseus, he's been on the island for seven years, and he's had no way to get off. Calypso has fallen in love with him and has tried to offer him immortality and everything, but Odysseus doesn't want it. He wants to go home. So Hermes comes and says, hey, Calypso, you got to let him go. So she does. And he builds a raft and starts sailing away, trying to get to Ithaca. However, Poseidon sees that Odysseus is off the island and immediately sinks said raft. And so Odysseus um, clings to peace and washes on the shore of Skira, where he meets princess Nausicaa. And for those Miyazaki fans, that is where the name Nausicaa, the Valley of Wind, comes from. Um... So, yeah, and he, he he then goes with the princess to her home and meets the king, and he tells the whole story of what happened. All right, next slide. All right, so this is Odysseus and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad business trip, because this trip sucks. So, after Troy, um, Odysseus and his um, Ithacan fleet, they decide, hey, let's do a raid on the way back. So they go to Ismaris, as you can see here on the map, and they, they, they mess it up. They, they, they kind of they failed the raid. Then they start going, and they manage to completely bypass Greece and go to what is today Libya and into the land of the Lotus Eaters. The Lotus Eaters are these people that have these like flowers and desserts that you eat, and it kind of makes you lose track of time. It makes you kind of lazy, um, similar to other narcotics today. Um, and so it happens, and all these men eat it, and – He's and they're like, okay, we don't want to go anywhere. And Odysseus has to drag them all back onto the ship. So he does. Then they leave there and they go to the island of the Cyclops, Polyphemus. So they're exploring and they see this big cave and they go in and uh, they get trapped inside by the Cyclops, Polyphemus. And Odysseus, uh, in using his guile, um, starts to talk and um, try to work his way out of the situation. He, he um, addresses himself as nobody. He says, I I'm nobody, and that's his name. And, um, and so he eventually works uh, works out a plan. They stab out Polyphemus' eye when he's asleep, and then they hide under the sheep um, when Polyphemus lets them out to um, uh, go graze. So they get out of there, and Odysseus, not arguably making the worst decision of his life, decides to yell his name to Polyphemus, saying, I'm the one who tricked you. My name is Odysseus, and screw you guys. So Polyphemus is immediately uh, decides to tell his dad, Poseidon, what happened. And Poseidon proceeds to make Odysseus' life as horrible as godly possible. And he does. So they uh, after the Cyclops, they go to Aeolus, the island of Aeolus, the god of the winds. He gives them a bag of wind saying, hey, this will help you speed your way home, but only use it when you see Ithaca. So they, uh, they start sailing towards Ithaca, and right when they can see it, one of his men sees the bag and says, oh, there's gold inside. I want it. And he opens it and immediately shoots them all the way back to Aeol the, the island of Aeolus. So Aeolus, kind of realizing that these guys are cursed and that he doesn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole, says, get lost. I'm not helping you anymore. And they do. They go to the Lastragonians, which is kind of, sort of where Italy, it was sort of, sort of where Rome is today, I think. And um, they ended up destroying most of their ships, and Odysseus only has his ship, the one he's on, left. Get there, they sail to Aia, which is the island of Circe, as Julianne mentioned. Deal with some things there. Um, Odysseus' men get turned into pigs, but Odysseus managed to like talk her out of it, and then they stay there for a year. Circe and Odysseus hook up. Um, tele Telegamon. Uh, becomes that child from that. And then she says, hey, you need to go talk to Tiresias in the land of the dead. 
So he does. So he goes to the land of the dead, talks to Tyrese. He said that as long as you do not touch the cows of Apollo, you're fine. Okay. We probably all know that how that's going to turn out, but we will see that in a minute. So they go back to Cersei. They say, all right, she's like, all right, go through Scylla and Charybdis on the way back. So they start going that way. They pass by the sirens. They don't have Orpheus with them as Jason did. So what they have to do is um, they plug their ears with wax. Um, everybody except Odysseus. He wants to hear the song. So they have him just tie him completely to the mast so he can't go anywhere. And so he can listen to it. And then at one point he's begging, please let me go in with the sirens and stuff. Um, but they don't. And so they go and then they go through Scylla and Charybdis, which is the Strait of Messina Day. And um, Scylla kills six people, six of his men. They go and they land on the island of Apollo's cattle. It's called Thrincissia. Thrincissia. And they're like, so Odysseus, remembering what Tyrus says, like, hey guys, whatever you do, don't eat cows. And in the same breath, the men are eating the cows. So they sail off the island and, sorry, Helios, I should say, not Apollo. Um, and so Helios immediately sinks the ship. Uh, then Odysseus washes up on shore to Calypso's island. And this is where kind of we've caught up with the story. After this, um, you can go to the next slide. So um, the king, feeling sorry for Odysseus, is like, hey, let me help you out. So he gives him more gold than he would ever have gotten in the Trojan War and a ship. And they drop him off in Ithaca on a secret cove while Odysseus is asleep. So he wakes up and has no idea what the hell he is. And then Athena comes like, hey, um, you're on Ithaca. I hid your gold somewhere. Um, so things are happening. You need help. Uh, he goes meets uh, a local farmer who was kind of always a friend to him. And then... He meets his son, and he reveals himself to his son, and they make a plan. So uh, Telemachus, his son, goes back to the suitors and kind of starts setting things up. Odysseus comes disguised as an old man and is telling um, and, and try to, tries to test Penelope about if she's kind of been faithful to him, which I would like to say is an extreme double standard given that he did it with everybody between here and Troy. So um, – yeah, so he does, and he tests it, and Athena then gives Penelope the idea, all right, so this is what the suitors have to do to win her hand. They have to, one, string the bow of Odysseus, and then they have to shoot it through 12 axe handles. So, the next morning, um, the suitors try to. Nobody can even string the bow. Um, it's so tough, and there's just only a special way to do it that only Odysseus knew how to do. So Odysseus disguised as the old man, I uh, says, hey, can I try? And the suitors laugh him off and say, no, ha, 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 whatever. Um, and But they, they let him try, and he does, and he shoots to the axe handles. Um, and then he reveals himself as Odysseus, and he and Telemachus kill all of them. Happy ending, right? All right, so that's kind of the Odyssey. That is like the whole overall story of the Odyssey. There are There's another chapter at the end which I've had people, I've had teachers describe to me as like fan fiction added on, saying that it doesn't seem like what Homer is writing. It seems completely different. Um, yeah, so next slide. All right, so Odysseus is pictured as a lot of different things, um, but kind of different from our other heroes. He is smart. He's... Um, he can be deceitful. And so um, he uses his mind and uses his guile. And this is really different from Achilles, from Ajax, uh, from even Agamemnon. Um, all of those are blunt instruments, and Odysseus is a precise instrument. So the Greeks, they value this, this um, knowledge, and they value this like ability to think. But the Romans absolutely hated Odysseus. Um, to them, it was the deceitfulness was kind of dishonorable even though they were deceitful as hell. Um, and also, uh, he, was the, he was the guy who came up with the Trojan horse. So they immediately say like, oh, hey, he's the bad guy. He's, he's uh, just the worst. So I actually want to get y'all's opinion real quick, just in the chat. What do y'all think? Odysseus, honorable hero or deceitful trickster? Like he in the, in the Odyssey 
and the Iliad, he's doing honorable things. He's, he's um, helping his men. He's uh, supporting heroes. A lot of things he's doing is talking. All right, yeah, I agree. This is a little sus. Seedful hero, honorable hero. So we got both, a mix. All right. He has the most morals. Honorable. I think we're going with honorable hero. Sounds like that. We're going deceitful hero. I, I kind of like the mix. He is a deceitful hero. One of his kind of famous things in the Iliad is um, the night raid with Diomedes, where they basically sneak into this camp and um, they meet another spy actually and kill him. And then they kind of like go on this like raid mission. Um, honorable trickster does immoral things in order to do something else that's moral. So yeah, Odysseus is kind of, it seems to be like one of the guys who's like, hey, I'll do the tricky stuff and it'll win the battle, but that's on me. So yeah, that's kind of um, the Odyssey really quick. And Odysseus, there's always different ways to think about heroes. Um, Odysseus as either the honorable Achaean or the deceitful um, Greek of uh, against Troy, uh, same with Achilles. You know, you can look at him as this brave hero, this this warning um, Avenger, or you can just look at him as a mass murdering psychopath, as the Romans probably did. Um, yeah, so I think we're going on to Colin next. Let's skip forward real quick and do the um, do the attendance slide. So go ahead and hop into the quizzes and find today's date and go ahead and select yellow. Today our chubby little baby Hercules killing his snakes is yellow. You know, I think if the Trojans would have had Among Us, they probably would have not fallen the way they did. You know, just with the Trojan horse and everything. I'd have thought, you know, there's actually a whole thing in the Aeneid about them. There's a guy who's like, hey, this looks pretty suspicious. And Poseidon, Neptune, like has snakes go up on shore and like and, and kill him and his sons. There's a famous statue of it, I believe. So yeah, I'm hearing. All right, who would vote Odysseus off? Who who would who would who's who thinks Odysseus is sus? All right, let's let's get a vote in the chat. Definitely sus. Sus. No. Okay. 
sus, sus. Everyone is sus. Not me. No, no. Okay, we're kind of. It seems pretty even right now. Okay, was Odysseus be blue? Odysseus vented. Okay, I can see that. You know, the night raid might be looked at something like vented. There's Colin, I think. All right. You know? Alrighty. Hi, everybody. So I'm really hoping I don't get kicked off the call for the fourth time. Um, but, and I know that my internet's a little sketchy right now. Okay, so we're going to be quickly talking about the Odyssey and pop culture um, and a little bit of the reception of it. Um, so the Odyssey might just be the most important and most popular of the ancient stories um, for various reasons. And it seems to be attracted uh, for many sided interests, kind of a pun on the ancient Greek word for um, Odysseus's term of being multi multiple sided or complicated. Um, and one aspect is that I really interest through the Odyssey, and he tells it in his own words. He's not making his own translation, but then he also gives a lot of cultural ex and explanatory context for what's happening. So we're going to go through four uh, branches of translation, literature, psychology, and cinema. Um, and I feel like we m may not get to all of them. but. All right, so one of the most recent translations came out in 2018 uh, by Dr. Emily Wilson of the University of Pennsylvania. So we say, okay, it's just another translation. You know, don't people do this all the time? Yes, they do. However, translating a work like this is a really long process. And it is not just putting words, trying to put words down on the page. You are really trying to capture the essence and spirit of a translation of a text that is 2,700 years old. And especially with the I no idea what they mean. And we've been trying to figure that out. Um, but Dr. Wilson does a great job in trying and interpreting the text and especially, especially trying to humanize people who are disenfranchised. So. In book 22 there, she points out that there was, um, this is the slaughter of the suitors. And especially when Odysseus says to Telemachus, you have to go kill the slave girls. So Dr. Wilson chooses the word choice um, instead of what previous scholars have called these women as whores for sleeping with the, the suitors. He, she calls them just girls. Now there's a difference in the sexual agency and how these women probably didn't have a choice either way of being in this patriarchal society. Um, and so by changing the one word, you give agency and, hu and the humanness to these women. All right, next slide. All right, so briefly, uh, one of the most famous uh, receptions is by James Joyce's Ulysses, written in 1922. And it's the main character, Leopold Bloom's journey in Dublin for one day. So this idea of going around uh, Dublin and with these real locations that are known um, within, which <laughs> at the bottom here in black, they, actually put the, put a quote from Ulysses. Um, that is how popular uh, this story is in not only Ireland, but in Dublin to write your name, um, put, your re put the Ulysses reference on your building. Um, and it is famous for being this chaotic and unstructured story. Um, and as well as it's taken on its own life. So, so a story that has taken from the Odyssey um, has taken now its own unique version and their plays, uh, play, 
spinoffs of you. Please. Okay. All right, well, we are getting into the next slide. Oh, there we are. So another book on Or it, it, uh, it seems like Colin might have gotten kicked out of the call again. Um, uh, TAs, have any have any of you read this particular book or any of you familiar? Um, okay, well, I've read this one, but we also are almost out of time. I can try and finish this off. So um, first of all, this is a great book. Highly recommend all of you read it. Very fun. Oh, Madeline it, Miller, awesome. Back. Oh, awesome. Colin's back. Take it away. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm barely back. All right, um, the point being, um, Julianne, if you can actually go to the last slide, um, we'll kind of skip through um, all this fun stuff. If you, if I would say, please reach out to me and other TAs, we can talk about um, the Odyssey in these multifaceted forms. Um, and in one of my favorite movies, it's Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, uh, which is just a fun romp through the American South, uh, taking and playing with these ideas of the Odyssey. The point being that the Odyssey has so many um, areas that people can have investigated artistically and will continue to do so. All right, with that, we are going to Dr. Rob. All right, everybody. That's all we got for this week. Um, just like uh, the adventures of Odysseus, sometimes Zoom is an adventure as well. Have a great weekend, everybody. We will see you back here on Monday. Uh, and no class next Wednesday. Next Wednesday is Veterans Day. Uh, so we just have Monday and Friday next week. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>